yes, I, I have my Excel spreadsheet, but I don't trust it. But here's the number, right? So, hey, nobody. You <laughs> 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 also don't know. Nah. <laughs> we talked for so long. <laughs> Be so passionately. <laughs> <laughs> this one, uh, this is the bonus for those who watch until the end. <laughs> <laughs> I woke up halfway and uh, I, I saw it uh, on the, in the lobby of the hotel. I saw it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome to Kopi in a Year, our second episode. And thank you so much for joining us. And today we have uh, four of us uh, to discuss some very, very important stocks for, for you guys. We have uh, Jumpat. Hello, Jumpat. Hello. We have John. Hi, everyone. Bunti. And myself. Okay, so if you are joining us first time, uh, so this is our uh, newly created podcast called Kopi in a Year. And why we call it uh, that is because we are basically just friends uh, trying to chat with each other on some interesting stock ideas that we have been researching on. And uh, I'll track it on our website, uh, learnwithstanley.com. And within a year, the next year, we'll come back and review all this stock. And the person that uh, have uh, researched on the best performing stock will earn a copy uh, from the team. Right? So that's, that's the whole uh, game that we're playing. And of course, as a full disclaimer, uh, this is just for education and uh, entertainment purposes. And we're doing it for fun. And uh, of, o o although we spend a lot of time on our research, uh, please remember that whatever view that we are, pro uh, we are, we are projecting today is our own personal view and does not represent any of our companies uh, or employers. And definitely do your own research before you invest in anything, right? And today we have four key stocks to talk to you guys about. And we have a well-known brand uh, in the construction space. And I'm going to talk about a very, very famous fast food chain as well. Uh, and we have a stock from Busa, Malaysia. Very interesting one. And lastly, we have one stock that, you know, to the, that can possibly go to the moon and back. <laughs> uh, but before that, let's uh, introduce our, our panelists today. Um, yeah. And our next guest uh, is Bunti, and he's first time joining us. First and time, I'm very yes. excited to hear from him as well. And uh, Bunti, why don't you introduce yourself first? Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Stanley, for hosting this. So um, my name is Bunti. Uh, I'm, I've, I'm maintaining my own YouTube channel, a very tiny one. And then together with my three friends, uh, we are co-hosting a uh, backholder pod, uh, similar to the one that we are having now. Uh, then in terms of professions, I'm actually in fin finance industry, uh, but I, I won't disclose much about uh, which company I work for. Uh. So we need to keep the, you know, the, the social life versus the profession life separate. Very good. Okay, so um, in terms of the company that I, I wanted to share, right, this is definitely uh, the company that I don't know whether they are still going to the moon or already at the moon and on, on the you turning back. So this one, uh, we need to see, and, and I'm still observing, like monitoring the progress of the company. Now. So the name of the company is uh, NVIDIA. So I'll just give a brief uh, description about this company. I know, I know that quite quite a number of you uh, use all these, you know, like the recent AI applications, right? Like ChatGPT, all this. So I think this, this company, uh, before ChatGPT, people know them as uh, gaming companies. So only people in, like, you're playing games, uh, you need those very powerful graphics, you know them. But now, after ChatGPT becomes so popular, it seems that also the share price went up so much, right? So it becomes quite quite a popular stock. Uh. But I think quite a number of people, they focus on the share price. Uh, what I try to do here is just to bring in more aspects of the companies uh, and so that we all have better understanding. Uh. So NVIDIA, they are... Uh, they're a pioneer in accelerated computing and now they call themselves as a full stack computing infrastructure company with data center scale offer offering. So what does that mean is that they are, aside from, you know, like design the chips, right? They also uh, come up with a lot of stuff on the software side. Say, for example, they have their CUDA platforms and then they have all these uh, software development kits. They have all the APIs. Mostly, those are the stuff that is on the software side, uh, which we will get into it because that is actually very important. In terms of the market, they cover data center, gaming, professional visualization, automotive, and so on. So why I like this company, right, is because 
first thing, the company is in semicon industry, and semicon industry is usually a, a very capex heavy uh, industry because you need to build chips and all these chips, right? Uh, as mentioned by John in the previous episode, it requires a lot of expensive machinery. But for NVIDIA, uh, it's not the case because they don't own all this uh, machinery. They actually just design the chip and then they will work with their partners. Say, for example, TSMC, Samsung, and then when it comes to memory, they buy memory from uh, Micron, from SK Hynix. Um, and, and they also engage independent contractors, uh, for example, like Honhai Precisions, Wistron, for example, in, in various parts of the process, uh, of the manuf manufacturing process. So, But what they are offering is basically just still GPU, but it's not like one GPU for to support one of your PC, but they are like data center GPU, which is like super huge scale. It's really to power up all these, you know, like LLM, LLM trainings, inference and so on. So basically, if you think about like all sorts of AI applications, right? For example, like it, you could be using AI for, you know, transcription, you could be producing image or video using AI. So behind the scenes, right, it's actually all these giant GPUs that's, that's supporting it. So basically, NVIDIA is um, like the dominant player and currently they are earning quite a decent amount of money by selling all these uh, products and offerings uh, and also a lot of services. Uh. So I think that, that's the first one. And then one more thing that I want to mention is that why I like this company is because they don't actually compete, okay? They create new market. Say for example, like they are so strong in all this uh, AI chip, right? It's because they are leveraging their strength in GPU. And then they say GPU, uh, although, I mean, in the initial years, it's really just to power up all these uh, video graphics, um, image, all these things, right? But they think of how to leverage this kind of technology in what they call the general purpose uh, field. Lah. So they call it GP, GPU. So, but the challenging thing about that is that in the initial years of development, right? Actually, there's no market. People don't know this GP, GPU can do what? Because when it comes to a lot of all this software development, right? People still, I mean, the entire industry is still using CPU because CPU is very flexible. You can use that to do all sorts of things. But when it comes to GPU, uh, aside from, from image, aside from video graphic processing, they're actually kind of useless. They, they, they haven't found the markets for like many, many years. That's why when it comes to all this AI, right? Th there's no competitors because NVIDIA is the only company that is in this field for quite a number of years. And so now after this whole, whole thing about AI suddenly picked up, right? And other competitors just find it difficult to play a catch up because they are not in the field for, you know, the first 10 years. So that's the runway that they had. Now. So I, I think just, just to quote uh, Peter Thiel, right? Uh, competitions is for losers. So when I think about this quote, I think about like, okay, NVIDIA, they are, they, they've proven themselves that not compete with other companies. Uh. So for whatever things that they're working on, right? Uh, really, you, you don't see much uh, competitions uh, just because how, how strong uh, they are. Um, when it comes to competitive uh, or mode lev level, right, I would just say it gets super high. And the reason is exactly because of the software stuff. So let, let's talk about like why all these um, customers, right, when it comes to buying uh, data center chips, right, they, although NVIDIA chip is, is not, it's not cheap, right? It's super expensive, but they have no choice, but they still buy it from them. Why? Because when it comes to all these uh, AI applications, right? It's not enough just to have the, you know, the GPU power up. You, you need the software and all these are very uh, application specific kind of things. So you, you need the CUDA platforms in order to make full use of all the libraries that's available. Basically, if you are a company, a startup doing some AI applications, and if you are using NVIDIA, right? Basically, it's like plug and play. You plug, then straight away, you can leverage up all the software that's available, all the libraries, all the SDK, all the API. You can use all those. Basically, you can start running already. But let's say if you have, uh, let's say a competitor's product, right? Say from AMD, right? Yes, you can still do these kind of things. Uh, it's just that when it comes to the software ecosystem, right? It's not as developed as NVIDIA. So what happened is that you probably can do, let's say 80% of the things, 
But when it comes to that 20%, right, of let's say just a library, right, to replace that, you still need your software engineer to develop that library for that applications. And after the developments, you are not sure whether they are optimized or not. So when you bring in all these other stuff that cost efficiency, right, like, like it, it slow it down, right? So it become very expensive already, you know? So although the chip, is very expensive coming from NVIDIA, but it's actually the, you know, the cheapest solutions for the customers. So they have no choice. They have to buy as long as you are doing anything related to AI. So I think that's the strongest uh, mode that they have, whereby there's just not much alternative out there. Lah, okay. So that, that's, um, I wanted to share. And also when it comes to these software things, right? Why they are so strong in it and why other uh, competitors find it hard to, just jump in and try to grab a market, right? It's because within this software ecosystem, right, there's already a flywheel that's running. What I, what I mean is that there's already quite mature uh, and then software developers are attracted to it because everyone working on AI, they are using NVIDIA chip. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're attracted to it. They, they help build all these uh, software libraries. And why they choose to build on this platform is because the users is already here. So there's a flywheel that more software developers are uh, attracted to the field and then they create more software and more software created more user and more user create like causing this positive flywheel. Now. So I think this is the, the strongest mode. Now. Mm. Just, just to give you some, some appreciate, right? I think when it comes to all these uh, NVIDIA uh, offerings, right? Because they are selling to businesses. So sometimes for retail investors, they, they might find it quite hard to understand uh, this company. But... Um, just think of like Apple, like Apple, let's say iPhone, right? It's so popular among uh, Apple fans. It's because all the app ecosystem is there. So imagine that now you can buy Apple phones, right? iPhones, but you cannot install iOS. You cannot mm -hmm. tap into the app store, right? Would you still buy the phones or not? I think the answer is no, right? Very, it's a clear no. It's just like the attractive part. It's not about the hardware. It's all about the software uh, ecosystem tied up. So, so I think that's the, the things that um, people don't appreciate enough. Yeah. All right. Now it comes to financials. Um, I just quote a few numbers because I don't, I think this is, you know, a bit, a bit, you know, getting into financials. Sometimes not easy to absorb, right? Yep. So why the share price went up so much? It's actually because the revenue went up a lot. Mm. So I quote the numbers of, on uh, last 12 month basis, right? Just one year ago, right? The revenue that they're generating is 33 billion. Okay. So, but the recent 12 months, it's already went up to 96 billions. That's like 3x increase in just one year. Mm. So it's like just revenue blows up, right? Like super high growth. And talking about the next 12 months, right? Analysts are projecting the revenue to go to as high as 150 billion. So that's another 50% kind of growth uh, mm. over the next uh, one year. So that, that's where the, you know, the optimism, uh, because high growth, and then even that 150 billion, we don't know whether that's the limit or that's the, mm. you know, that they, they are trying to give some conservative estimate and they're going to exceed that, right? So, so that, that's uh, the revenue growth. Another thing that is super attractive is really the margin. If you look at the margin, right, gross margin is at 76%. And then the net margin is at 55%. They can have this kind of high margin is because when it comes to their business, they don't deal with all the high capex uh, part. That part, they leave it to their contractors. So they just deal with the, the, the highest value adding stuff, which is the chip design, the services, and, and also all this, uh, you know, creating this software kind of things. Okay. Very complicated, but very and hard. And the engineers replicate. can still drive for shares. Uh. <laughs> I think that's uh, actually you can name that as the one of the highest uh, risks because how to motivate your employees when they are all driving Porsches and they have you know like twenty millions in their account, right? So I think that's one one of the risks that uh, uh, you, if you read news article, they are they are stating that as as one of the key risks. Uh. Okay. But when when it comes to now talk about the risk, right? So I think the risk is that now we can have all these you know like great numbers is because. Their customers, right? They are having an arm race to buy, like who can buy more GPUs. They, mm. they are basically, you know, there's fear of missing out when it comes to buying their products. So they can, you know, basically charge the numbers and still buyers are there, right? So numbers definitely looks good. But we don't know how long this will last, right? Mm. It could be, you know, just six months, 12 months, 24 months, who knows? So I, I think that this slowdown in growth, right, definitely will occur. It's just that we don't know when it will peak. We don't know. 
uh, it is like when it will happen, but it will happen at some point in the future. So, mm. so that that's definitely one thing. And but when that happened, right, I will, I will expect that all customers, whatever that caused them to stop or slow down their purchase, right, it will affect not just one customer, it will affect all the customers, right. So, so it will come with a surprise and for sure the, the share price will, will be affected. The revenue will be affected, right? So I think that's definitely the, the risk to watch out for. Mm. So now comes to the conclusions, right? Okay, just to, for disclaimer, I hold these stocks. Uh, I, it has appreciated uh, about seven times since uh, my cost base. Um, I never sold a single share. It is the largest uh, company in my portfolio. But I still keep it like, you know, less than, I, I think it's like around 20% of my portfolio. So my stance for, uh, in, when it comes to this company is that I'm holding on just to see where they are going. Uh, I'm not recommending anyone to buy given that they have appreciated so much. And I, I'm just trying to encourage people not just, you know, watch the companies just because the share price has went up. It's just that try to appreciate the businesses, the management, because there's a lot to learn just from studying these companies. Uh. So that's why I'm sharing this company. Passions. Oh, Stanley, you want to go first? I got tons. <laughs> I'm worried. I think. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, then I'll, I'll start with the easy one. Uh. But thank you for sharing this, com uh, this company. I think it's uh, top of the town, uh, especially this year. Uh, especially since uh, you know Tesla stock has been a bit lack lackluster over the past few years, and this has been the replacement stock, lah, right? Kind of. Yes. <laughs> but uh, it, my question also linked back to to Tesla. So so yeah, the, the, right now, uh, of course, Nvidia provide all the full uh, full stack services and everything for for AI, but uh. uh Many of the big companies they are also developing their own chips, right? Uh, yep. your, your Google, your Amazon, your 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 Microsoft and Tesla as well uh, with XAI. So especially all these are the big cloud provider also. How do you see that you know if uh, the relationship between them and, and Nvidia will change or would they really have the capability to reach the level that Nvidia is? What's, mm. what's your thought on that? Yeah, I think that that's a uh, very good question. So, uh, when, when it comes to competitions, right? Yes, just uh, I, I mentioned AMD, but you you rightly pointed out that their cus their competitors is often their customers. So, for example, Meta buying uh buying their GPU, but they are developing their chips, and this is true for many others, right? Like Microsoft, yeah. Amazon, they are all developing their chips. But if you look at uh the details, right? Actually, all these so called like customers slash competitors, right? Uh, they are not designing GPUs. Yep. What they are designing, right, is what they call the uh, ASIC, application specific, specific. Yeah. <laughs> a a a SIC, application yeah. specific integrated chip. Uh, okay, so that uh, ASICs. So what is this ASICs, right? Uh, I think to put it simple mm -hmm. is that uh, ASICs is a chip that works super well in a application specific situation meaning that okay you know you are designing this chip for this specific purpose right they will be super good by super good i mean they are running very fast and then they are very efficient when it comes to energy uh, but they are they only optimize for specific applications hmm. so so i think that's the best part about asic but that's also the problem with asic so why i say it is the best part is because uh let's say you are YouTube, right? You say, I, I have to process a lot of all this video. You know, every second people upload this kind of podcast and, and 30 minutes is not enough. We are going to do two hours. So we upload, right? YouTube need to process this and they know exactly what kind of chip to do this job, right? Mm. So, and, and this kind of chip is definitely not CPU chip. It is uh, ASIC because they, they know um, the, the chip design they don't they don't have to have everything they just to do video processing well right then the mm. design is good to, for them already so they are doing this kind of things so but they are all different kind of things right say for example uh google design that tpu is different they are optimized for uh their purpose and then when it comes to meta it's slightly different but it works for them right but what is the biggest difference between all these you know asics uh versus uh nvidia gpu is that gpu right is still very flexible by flexible, meaning that they are general purpose. Uh, let's say you have whatever LLM that open AI or all these you know, AI companies that they're doing now, right? Maybe this is the LLM um, you know, models that they're training. Imagine that, let's say one year from now, suddenly a new model come up that 
okay, you just realize that you need to reprogram the entire things in order to train, in order to do inferencing. But if you are designing a, a, a ASICs, right, sometimes you, you just realize that, oh, uh, the model is so different that now your chip is not optimized for this new model already. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to NVIDIA, the good thing is that they are general purpose. They can be reprogrammed and then this ensure that the shelf life uh, of all these uh, chips right, can stay very, very long. Mm. So I, I think that's the, the best part about it is like they are flexible enough to evolve with all the new development of AI. Uh, at the same time, they are super powerful and they can do stuff that normal CPU cannot do. I think they are at the sweet spots. Huh? But also this one, you have to come back. Right? It's like, do you believe that all these model, all these AI model, right? Have they really already become saturated, already, you know, stabilized and there's not much improvement from here? Or do you think that there will be all these different new model that come up that is super different compared to whatever that they are doing now? And, and so if you think that this field is still evolving and the evolvements, right? It's not like tiny evolvements. It's like different entire new family of software models that come out, right? Then you really want to bet on NVIDIA just because of the flexibility. So when it comes to chips, right, it's always a trade-off between the efficiency versus the flexibility. So mm. another extreme will be CPU. CPU is still the most uh, efficient, uh, the flexible one. It's just that when it comes to efficiency, they are super, super bad. Mm. So, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. And I'll leave the question for the rest of John and JP. Yeah, uh, probably one from me first. Uh, key man risk. So, um, I mean, huge admirer, fan of Jensen. Yep. I think uh, even uh, Chris Malowski, which is his co-founder and all that, they're mm -hmm. usually in the background. Uh, but at the same time, he's kind of, Jensen has achieved one, kind of like a CEO superstardom kind of mm -hmm. thing. With yep. that um, comfort uh, <laughs> jacket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at least you remember the jacket. <laughs> yeah, the signature leather jacket, right? Yeah. So, um, I think a lot of where NVIDIA headed the directions, even buying Mellanox, right, mm. which is the networking company, which is a great acquisition from, Gen on, from Jensen's uh, view, right? Uh, how is that going to be replicated, uh, you know, once Jensen is, is away? I mean, that, that's something that I, I don't know the answer to. Mm. And hopefully, mm. maybe I can, you can shed some light on it. Yeah, uh, definitely when it comes to, you know, like founder, CEO, right? He has been there for so many years. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think the one, one of the longest running uh, tech company CEO, founder CEO, right, is him and Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg yeah. also, I think it's like 20 plus years. Uh, so yeah. so they, they are all running quite quite long already. And I, I don't see the sign of they are retiring. Uh, so true for Jensen and also Mark Zuckerberg. Uh. So, but Kim Harris is still there, right? And we mm -hmm. all need to recognize like Jensen Huang is super good, not just as like a vision leader, but also when it comes to, I think he's the best salesman. So yeah, you look right. at look at that's he right. giving his GTC talk, right? It's like oh, it's like everything is right. It's like that, that's how he get that kind of you know like magic, right? Yeah. Basically, very good at storytelling and, and so on. Uh, I'll say I'm not that worried because for you know like leader like him, right? It's a bit similar to like Steve Jobs already. But the good mm. thing is that he's really like before the company let's say fail at his fifth year, right? Now he has the chance to bring this company to you know like running for many many years. And so whatever um, things that he wants to shape this company, he, he's already given time and there's already a very strong culture uh, that's embedded with the companies on how it is run. So mm. I, I think, for example, like just comparing this company versus, let's say, a conglomerate that, that uh, John, you just mentioned, right? Is that for NVIDIA, they are very specific and very clear on what they wanted to do and what they don't want to do. Yeah. So that is very, very clear. That's right. uh, it's a very simple company to analyze. Of course, when it comes to the, all the detailed tech, right? Of course, the tech is like, okay, la, me, yeah. we all as a retail investor, we don't, we don't, <laughs> uh, you know. We're not going to the nuts and bolts. Uh, yes, together, those la. are too <laughs> difficult to understand. So, yeah. so that's why it's very hard to replicate. But to mm. understand the overall business is still not too difficult to, to understand. So I think the culture is there. So I imagine that, let's say, even one day Jensen is gone, right? Uh, it will be similar to Apple situation whereby, mm. you know, the company with the culture can still run very strong. Yeah. And also now they are, you know, just embarking on this new AI, you know, world, right? And, and they are strong in it. So it's very hard to replace. So even without the strong leader, right? Just just execute whatever vision that they have today, right? I think they still have a very long uh, run rate, uh, long road ahead. Uh, so so I'm not worried about that. Okay. Yeah. Th thanks for sharing your insight. So I think that leads me to the toughest question, which is, 
what do you think of N- N- Nvidia's valuation right now? <laughs> Yo, okay, thanks a lot. Uh, no right or wrong, uh, but it's interesting <laughs> no, to, to get a chip can be fifty times or hundred <laughs> times, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so thank, thanks a lot, uh, JP, for asking this question. I think I, I left that out. Uh, not purposely. I, I actually forgot to cover that. But but actually, my, my comment on this is that um, just just tell a short story on on valuations, right? Um, I would say two years back, around end of 2022, I run a DCF. Wow, very fancy DCF, right? I come up with the numbers, everything, and then I noticed that. After I run the numbers, right, even the share price, like, you know, crash a lot. You can just look at the share price, like low 2020, uh, end of 2022, where's the bottom, right? When I do the DCF at that point, right, I was like, what, this company dropped so much already, still expensive. I'm not going to buy this company. You know, I, I think I have some position, is that, it's just that I'm not adding. Because when this company, when they are running, like, when the, the financials are good, right, Revenue good, margin good, everything good. But when they are bad, right, everything bad. Mm. So I, I think when it comes to DCF, given that now everything is good, right, I, I would say be careful on whatever DCF that you're running. You will be wrong and you will be wrong by huge magnitude. So that's yeah. why I, I don't trust my own uh, DCF. Right? But because, you know, I did a sharing with our group of friends, uh, Kairos group, right? So I'm forced to do that because that's the one of the requirements. So <laughs> I still run. That's the benchmark. <laughs> that's the benchmark. So I still run the, my numbers. I say, but there's a lot of caveat to it. Uh. But, I don't yeah, trust but, my own numbers. <laughs> yeah, I don't trust my own numbers. Oh, I, don't I, trust my numbers. I don't trust Excel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I have my Excel spreadsheet, but I don't trust it. But here's the number, right? So, so... Uh, I think that this year I have a, like a base uh, bull bear scenario, but I just quote the number, right? The base scenario I have right, is the $100 uh, share price. Uh, that, that's my base. And the bull one is 140 I just quote the number that I quoted to, to them to, to stay consistent. But I just want to say that all these things, right, um, is really highly subjective to the, what's the, and the ultimate size of this AI. And yeah. the question that you need to ask yourself is not the DCF uh, assumptions. It's yeah. that down the road, five years down the road, right? What, like, let, let's ask yourself, right? When it comes to, let's say you have a complaint on any product that you're using, when you call the data center, do you expect, is the human answering these questions or is it just, uh, you know, uh, AI answering these questions? So five years down the road, if you have kids, do you think that your, your kids' tuition will be taught by, uh, you know, like a, a human teacher or is it by AI teacher? So I think if you have different vision, right? These mm-hmm. two different very visions leads to yeah. your assumptions and then that, that will flow through your, you know, the DCF. Your valuation. Yeah. Yes, yeah. the valuations. The and also it's, yeah. it's not just, you know, um, like it, I think it will be there. I'm quite sure that all this AI teacher, AI uh, data, uh, customer service, all these, all sorts of AI will be here. It's just that whether you come in next two years, five years, or next 15 years? This is the question, right? Because if it gets 15 years, I would say the company is overvalued. But we have, we have experienced some of this magic, right? I'm sure uh, like ChatGPT could be one. I think the most recent one will be the one that just rolled out by um, OpenAI, the advanced uh, voice. Uh, is it, mm-hmm. I think for, for those who have tried this product, I haven't tried it because I have no access. But just, I mean, go to I YouTube, YouTube, just search yeah. it. And then you, you will see that the kind of, uh, you know, magic that, that's offered by AI, you know. So I think they will be here and it, it may come sooner than many people. Nice. That's my validation number. So I, nice. I answer the questions. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's not like I try to avoid. <laughs> Tell a nice story just to avoid. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. Great. I think this, this uh, company is, you know, is on all of us, our mind. And uh, later, you know, before, before we end, uh, we'll, we'll do a quick round of disclaimer also of every stock. We'll just uh, hands up and see which one you guys uh, are invested in. Uh, right? mm-hmm. But Bunti, thank you so much for sharing thank NVIDIA. Uh, more about the business. You know, this is something that my wife recently bought for her own portfolio. But wow. uh, she don't understand what the video does as well, <laughs> right? She, she just thought, oh, everybody's buying it, you should buy it. Uh, but, uh, and, and I'm definitely going to share this with, with, with her. And, uh, but before, before you, uh, I let you go, uh, why don't you also answer the same question uh, so that yep. we can know you a little bit better? Uh, what is your biggest investing mistake so far? Yep. I think uh, the example that, that like, is like what you all share, right? There are many mistakes, but the one that I want, wanted to quote, right, is uh, this company called Meituan. Mm. 
So I think the stock is not important. The important is how the process of the mistake. Okay. Yeah. So I got into this company, uh, the exposure, right? It's through what they call the option, you know? Mm. So I play mm. options, very smart. Okay. So I go and sell a put option of this company thinking that, okay, let's say I sell at certain strike price. If it falls below the strike price, I get the shares. I'm fine with that, you know? Mm. Sounds very, you know, like solid kind of thinking, right? Mature investor. This guy, no, no options, okay? <laughs> then what happened is that right after I sold the put, right? It's already on my brokerage app, right? One lot, you know, one lot. But suddenly I just look at the PL, it's like, how cannot be? Like the 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 PL moves so much. It's like so it's like so crazy. And and that was also the period when I think there's a lot of volatility. Uh, it's already off the peak. And then the company is like um like experienced huge volatility because of uh, the China risk and so on, right? But still cannot be the volatility is so high, right? Mm. Then I mean just to cut it the story short is that I just realized that for Hong Kong market. When you sell a uh, put options one one contract, right? It is not like US market. It's like hundred shares. It's mm. like just one wet one one contract five hundred shares. Correct. So, so I think that is really a huge uh you know red flag, right? Like what I did it wrong. But the right thing to do in that kind of scenario is that you just close the positions, right? What kind of P and P and L that hitting me the moment I realized I should have closed it, but I didn't. I thought that it's okay. I wait for a while. Maybe it's just like daily volatility. I just want to, you know, like wanted to wait a bit for the positions to, you know, like lessen up my losses to close it. But what ha happened after that is just like, you know, one straight line down and I have huge positions. Like, like I, I, I let the shares get, you know, so-called like delivered, meaning that I have the positions. And then I just waited until now. It's like still a huge losses of my portfolio. But I, I did that after I did a research on the company and I like the founders, I like the mm. business. Uh, it's just that I know that this company is not as solid as the other big China tech, say for example, like Tencent or Alibaba. It is, of course, um, a, a riskier one compared to the largest two. Mm. But still, it is a mistake. Uh. I, I would say the mistake is not the company selection. It's more like, you know, the, the, the thinking of, oh, it's a mistake, realizing it is 500 shares, but still continue to wait. Nah. I think when you realize it gets a mistake, right? Don't back holding to the positions. You should close it as soon as possible because it's, it's already outside the appetite. Nah. So, yeah, so I yes. think that's the, the, the key learning for me. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that, I Thank think you. that's a very important lesson. Nah. At the end of the day, it's uh, asset allocation, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's not how much you lose, uh, how much... Uh, the, 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 which stock you buy but rather how much you buy <laughs> on, on each stock precisely uh, <laughs> yeah thank you so much you really need to thank double you. check the lot size for, <laughs> for all kinds of stocks exactly exactly and not I just think... understand the stocks but also the option contract because yeah. it's totally different you know yes yeah. the, and don't think that you understand one instrument for one market, then you think that you understand that instrument for all markets. Precisely. This kind of assumption, don't make the kind of stupid mistakes. <laughs> for especially, me, I'm definitely the stupid one. Yeah, <laughs> especially global investing, uh, different exchanges, different yes. sets of rules and all yes. that. I think that's... Uh, yeah. That thing is true. <laughs> okay, uh, Jumpat. Thank you so much. Up. Yeah, I'm Jupan. Um, I'm currently working in the project management space. Um, have been bitten by the investing bug for eight years and still going strong and firmly, firmly believe that it is my ikigai and it was something I foresee myself continuously doing until I'm an old man. So the company that I'm going to present today, I'll start it off with a riddle. You guys try to guess which company I'm, I'm trying to present. So I am founded in the year of 1890, so around 134 years of history. Yeah. I have a market cap of 183 billion US dollars. I operate in the heavy machinery industry. I am a dividend aristocrat. My livery or my team color is yellow and black. Mm -hmm. I derive my name from a bug on an insect. Who am I? You said construction, right? Yes. Heavy machinery. Ah. I'm guessing deer. From an insect. Bark, la. insect. Oh, bark, bark. <laughs> not, a, not an animal. Okay. <laughs> so wrong guess. Anyone else? <laughs> he already told me, so I'll, I'll skip the game. <laughs> close, close. It's a competitor to deer. So the answer is Caterpillar Inc. Stock code NYSC CAT. So 
that's the company I will be um, presenting on today. So I'll start off with a brief, brief history of the company. So it was founded in 1809 by Benjamin Holt as Holt Manufacturing. So the first products of the company were just steam tractors and the tractors back there needed to do heavy workload and it was still on the wheels that we know today, right? And they needed to be big, they needed to be heavy to pull heavy loads and problems arise when they operate in muddy and damp grounds, causing them to sink. So what Holt did that he bought the chain track patent from Richard Hornsby and Sons, an English company. And the alleged story is that a photographer saw the chain tractors invertedly from his old school camera lens and commented that they look like caterpillars. And hence, it became the company as it's known today. And these early chain track tractors eventually become inspirations to the tank, tank that we know and see of. Right, so you have a train, the track, and then you have a, a tractor carrying a gun. So that eventually became the inspiration of the tanks that we know of. Fast forward to today, Caterpillar Inc. has more than 400 types of heavy machineries. So ranging from hydraulic excavators, shovels, backhoe loaders, graders, dozers, trucks, and the picks and shovels of the construction business. So we talked about it in our first episode that um, John was uh, fanatic of the uh, pick and shower business, in, but particularly in the semicon, but this is the one that is doing the dirty job in the heavy industries, right? And they serve companies within the construction, mining, and the material handling industries. Uh, surprisingly, they also have a small defense port, uh, products portfolio where they come out with a hybrid kind of uh, tractor and tank uh, to sell to, you know, defense, um, in uh, defense, government defense and they also have financial products. So that offers the financial uh, and insurance services of Caterpillar products and services. They also own the rights to manufacture, market and sell products. So you might come across um, safety shoes or boots manufactured and marketed under the Caterpillar or CAT trademark. So they also own that part of it. And slowly across the years, they have also launched and pushed out technology solutions through their CAT Connect and MindStar. And that allows, you know, companies to manage fleet um, systems, equipment, management analytics, and also some sort of basic autonomous machine capabilities. So their business is categorized into three main segments. So the construction in, uh, industries, the resource industries, the mining companies, and then lastly, the energy and transportation. So this particular segment will support the client in terms of the oil and gas segment, the power generation, the marine, the railway industry as well. So a breakdown of their top line and also their operating profit. So construction brings in around 40% of their total revenue, the industries 20% and the energy and transportation 40%. So 100%. In terms of operating profit, construction also comes in at 44% and then energy and transportation at 38% and then industries at 18%. So far, any um, questions or any, you know, um, thing that piques you uh, in terms of why I chose um, Caterpillar? I used to deal with a subsidiary that I thought had no relation with uh, the tractor business and that was the division that sold gas turbines. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah which yeah. is uh, solar. Uh, yeah, so loud. Yeah, and yes. I didn't know they belong to Caterpillar, Caterpillar until, right? I arrive yeah. at the, <laughs> until I arrive at the factory in San Diego. Huh? What does uh, tractors and th gas turbines have anything in common? Uh? Yeah. yeah, that was also something that I found intriguing uh, when I did dive into the company. So, in a way, it's kind of diversified because we know them as a heavy machinery produce, uh, producer or they pick and shower from that aspect, but they also have a little bit of um, exposure from the oil and gas because they also are the service providers for this kind of industry. So, of course, if you look at the heavy machinery and equipment sector, it can be very competitive. So, I will just name a few of the competitors within this space. So, you have Liu Gong, Sunny, XM XMCG, and Zoom Lion. These are the China companies that also offer the same value proposition and at a cheaper price. And from the US, as John mentioned just now, there's Deer, and there's also CNH Industrial, a bit the smaller size uh, compared to Caterpillar. So Caterpillar's strength compared to its competition lies in its dealership. They have a very large and vast dealership network and after-sales service. So they don't sell it themselves. They actually outsource 
this to a dealer. And some of these dealers are so big that they are actually listed companies themselves. So to give you an example, Sun Dabi uh, in Malaysia is the sole dealer for Caterpillar Malaysia. Right? So it's that big until the dealers can themselves be a listed company. And due to that, um, their promise on, on value proposition is that they offer superior quality equipment and that has fostered uh, a premium product reputation amongst its peers. And they do have quite a lot of brand, uh, brands under their portfolio. So um, Hindustan is also under them, Anchor is also under them. And um, what John mentioned is not that um, the solar with turbines is under them as well. And in terms of market share, surprisingly quite fragmented. So out of pie chart, uh, Caterpillar is the market leader, but they only control 16% of the total market. Coming next, the second largest is Komatsu, a Japanese listed um, TV machineries at 11%. And then you have the China, India at around 5% each. And the other fragmented part of it, it's around 38%. So it's a two side of coin story. You can mention, you can say that this industry is so fragmented that everyone has a slice of a pie. Or from the flip side of it is that Caterpillar has still so much room to grow. I can, you know, attack and eat up the smaller market share uh, players and they can also go head to head with the other well-known competitors like I mentioned just now. So for, for talk on that. Uh. Next, going through to the financial part. So in terms of um, operating margins, why I actually chose Caterpillar over there. So I was looking at two companies and I was contemplating which one to actually present today. Both are actually good companies and I. it took me a while to pick Caterpillar on uh, versus Deer because the fact that um, Caterpillar has much more superior operating margins compared to Deer and Caterpillar's revenue is less cyclical than Deer. So Deer, even though it off, operates in a similar space as Caterpillar, but they are more skewed towards farming equipment. So you talk about the um, tractors that focus more on picking cotton, sowing seeds. So Deer is very good at that. So there is a article that tries to differentiate Caterpillar and Deer in the sense that Caterpillar would focus on servicing the clients within the mining and the heavy industry, while Deer doesn't really go so deep into that. And then on the flip side, Deer really knows the best equipment when it comes to farming and Caterpillar just stay by the sideline, not going to, you know, helping, uh, going to the court at the deer side. So they, they do have kind of a special niche, even though it's a heavy industry kind of um, sub-segment. And um, net margins, only deer and Caterpillar uh, achieved 15% or above uh, post-pandemic compared to the uh, competitors in the likes of Komatsu, XMCG and Sunny Group. And free cash flow margins wise, only both Deer and Caterpillar were consistently above 10%. So ROA, return of assets, is 10%. And one neat pick that I had for Caterpillar is that they have rather a long average cash conversion cycle, which is more than 100 days. So this is something I just don't like when I look through the um, big picture when they're financials wise. So moving on to the growth potential and risk and challenges part, um, the growth can be quite straightforward, um, mainly touching on the US bipartisan infrastructure law funding. So this is um, the law uh, passed by uh, President Biden that um, they are going to spend $456 billion to upgrade the roadways, railways in the United States. So fun fact, the statistics states that one in five miles of US roadways uh, needed upgrading. So that's 20%. And out of the 45,000 uh, bridges, out of the six, total 600 bridges, so that's around 15% of bridges also need upgrading. So from that scale, you will know that easily 10 to 20% of US infrastructures needs um, upgrading due to poor condition. And the law also contains funding to rebuild and reinvest US railways, public transit infrastructures. And that kind of plays into the thesis and prospects, not just to but, uh, cat Caterpillar, but also companies Operating within the um, heavy machinery space. And on the flip side, um, some worrying or concerns is that the dealer inventories that um, help to push or market Caterpillar's products 
they are seeing a little bit of reduction uh, and, and shrinking when you compare it across a queue to queue basis. And you can see that um, due to the fact that in terms of commodity prices, so your cotton prices, corn prices, soybean prices, and even coal, they are a bit on the downside right now. So that does the uh, put out, just that just that, that do um, you know postpone the initiatives or the appetite for the players within this uh, space to you know undergo payback cycle to buy new machineries. So that is a near term headwind uh, I managed to catch or observe by looking at the report, and of course, this cyclical risk will definitely be an ongoing um, kind of a. Uh, play when you look into companies operating in this kind of space. So they are serving companies or clients within the commodity space and also the mining space. And cyclicity is always there. It's a risk. It's an inherent risk. They cannot really diversify out of it because uh, it's just the nature of the business. And also one concern that um, I'm trying to also think outside of the box is that um, we do see a lot of electrifying initiatives in terms of vehicles. and Caterpillar's products are still mainly running you know, on petrol, diesel, gas. And the story next for the next 10, 5 to 10 years would be, is Caterpillar going to do the same thing, but pushing out their offerings coming in an electric drive train and also playing the ESG uh, ball game as well, because it's going to be a big team as well. And how is a company you know, serving in this space trying to also um, sing the tune of ESG team. So they did mention they are working with Veo, one of the largest mining companies, uh, ser service servicing and providing them electric mining trucks. And also the gas generator now also runs on hydrogen fuel. So there is initiatives. It's just how it will eventually become the main thesis for them to continue it. Right. So a little bit of statistics is that the global construction equipment market size is still going to grow at a compounded 4% uh, year on year from 2023 to 2031. And then surprisingly also the greenhouse emission intensity that Caterpillar reports is also downtrending as well from 2018 to 20. So valuation wise, it trades at a PE at 18 times. Enterprise value over EBIT is 15 times neither here or neither there in terms of uh, expensive or cheap. So even though the revenue hasn't really grown that much over the last 10 years, the management has a slow, solid track record in terms of returning value to shareholders. So it has a 30 year streak of increasing dividends from the year of 1993 until 2023. So that qualifies it to become a dividend aristocrat. So eight cents dividend per share until $5 dividends per share over that um, 30 years uh, time frame. And they've also um, been very, very consistent in their share repurchases. So that lowers down the weighted average of sending shares from around 600 million to 550 million. And the mandate of Kopi in a year is picking up stocks that outperform the S&P 500. So across the last 10 years, um, this stock has actually returned 4,700% Dividends included against the SPY, which is um, 280%. So that is why it convinced me that this is a company, although operating in a cyclical business or has the cyclicity risk, but it is operating in a somewhat evergreen business. It does need to you know, innovate and push out electrifying um, drive trains into the products, and they could still be around for the next 50 to 100 years or so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much for that detailed uh, analysis. Okay, I, I, I'll start off with the question, maybe, I guess. Uh, yeah. And the question is, you know, uh, yes, you mentioned that it has been a, a great outperform performer of the S&P 500 uh, over the longer term. Yeah. Uh, but I just want to also double check with you. But you, uh, you said that you know, in the last few years, their revenue haven't really grown that much. So how has the stock performed, say, in, in the closer, maybe five to 10 year period against S&P 500? I think year to date, the stock did really, really well. So not mistaken, year to date wise, last I checked, it's 
easily above um, 20% as well. Let me double check here to date. Yeah, it's a uh, 29.22% year to date. Okay. Yeah. Um, but they did that. Uh, so so apart from just increasing the dividends, but their earnings per share is not really growing that much as well, right? Their earnings per share, I believe, is also um, growing, but most of their returns to shareholders is coming in the form of um, cost savings is in terms of cost management, but also um, share buybacks that is actually you know lowering down the average outstanding shares, and that is actually helping to um, boost the um, basic earnings per share. Right. Yeah. You assume that that will be continue to be sustainable, lah, The way yeah. that they are buybacks. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. uh, just now, did you mention like uh, their geographical market? Uh, how much of their sales actually just in North America or you know? Yeah. Else? So, um, in terms of geographical wise, fifty percent, almost half is from America, and the basic, uh, the other half of it is derived from South America, so Asia, Europe, and uh, Africa. Interesting. I yeah. assumed. Uh, I, I in my mind is uh, you know I, I'm assuming it will be much much bigger than that <laughs> but anyway uh, yeah um, great uh, I think it's a great business uh, well diversified uh, probably just two questions for me one is um, while I understand the cyclical nature of uh, the industries they serve would you happen to know um, roughly what is the capex replacement cycle for a tractor like for example what, what tractors do they sell and then uh, the second question is very much related to that as well. Um, are the consumables uh, captive uh, market? That means uh, whatever spare parts, whatever things that they buy, once you buy a Caterpillar kind of machinery, yeah. uh, are, are they uh, harnessing uh, not uh, after-sales service or after-sales uh, revenue from these these guys? And is it is it a growing trend? Because uh, we understand capex cycle comes and goes, especially yes. in industry. But uh, are they making it up in you know selling the consumables or the spares so that at least you know during downturns when people are not buying, then there's some kind of recurring revenue. Yes, there is. So um, just now I mentioned that they split their business into the construction, the um, industries, and also the material handling, etc. Uh. So one of their strong or how do they really justify is that. Their dealers is actually not only helping the market and push out the tractors, but they're also offering the after sales service so in terms mm. of parts, etc. So the dealers is also playing their part. And they have been um, quite vocal in terms of saying that, yes, we understand that our business can be cyclical in terms of the capex uh, of their end clients. That's why they are also having, they are also marketing or sharing the fact that they are also quite into ensuring that um, in terms of servicing of the tractor, servicing of these equipments, yes, the dealers are also there to help ensure that the cyclicity factor is, is even now. It won't take it out, but it's actually helping to absorb it in, in the case of you know drastic drops in commodity prices and clients are not willing to you know spend money on buying new machines. But they do have that in terms of the servicing and offering these bad parts. I see. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That's it for me. Bunti? Do you have any questions? Yeah, I just have uh, one question. So I, I look at the revenues, right? It yeah. goes like almost flat in the past 12 years and then a bit, a bit of uh, cyclical. That, that's okay uh, because we know that the heavy industries, uh, they often, they are you know, cyclical. But the, the curious part is that I look at the margin. Margin is actually trending up. So yes. usually I'm thinking that companies that they are able to improve margin is because their scale get larger and then there's efficiencies when it comes to cost management and so on, right? But surprisingly for Caterpillar is that the revenue can stay flat with cyclical, but yet the margin they can push up. So I'm quite curious. Is that means that they are so well at controlling their costs that you can just generate same amount of revenue in the past 12 years? Uh, I mean, like flat, right? But then just keep cutting costs until they, their <laughs> margins is keep improving. That, that's quite surprising to me. Is there any backstory that you can sell, uh, that you can share that, that illustrate why this is possible? I think that also chimes in back to um, John asking whether the service part and also the um, machineries uh, so, uh, repairing part comes to play. So I, I believe that the management is also well aware that Caterpillar products, their products, 
are quality products and people don't usually you know buy new tractors buy new shovels when it breaks down people will be more people will want to actually repair it like even if our phones are spoiled we, we tend to want to repair it because we don't want to spend a few hundred few thousand to get a new phone right i think the management acknowledged that and they have put a lot of initiative and efforts to ensure that repair um, efforts are there the parts that their clients needs are there and this has been rolled out and it's a hand-to-hand -hand kind of cooperation that they ensure that the dealers are not in just incentivized to push out new um, equipments but also coming in to support um, the end customer whenever parts repairs are needed and that also kind of make clients want to you know even though caterpillar products are much more expensive but in their mind is that even if there's something wrong with the equipment they are more than assured that um, i can always repair it i don't need to fork out additional money when times are bad to get a new equipment and then worrying the equipment might break down because it's not as quality as caterpillar because these are you know industries where wear and tear is high or you really need to have an equipment, a very good shovel or a very good pick to ensure that it doesn't break during um, the work is happening at the site. So that really captures my, my, my mind as well. And when I look at it, revenue is flat, but damn, your margins are growing big. Interesting, interesting. Uh, any more questions for JP? All right. Yeah, that's a uh, very interesting stocks and definitely will I think we, all of us will check it out later on our own time as well. Uh, but before you go, uh, JP, you know, um, I, I guess we'll, we'll try to sneak in a few questions more about your personal questions. So over the course of the year, uh, our audience can get to know you a little bit better. So before you go, maybe on a quick one minute question, you can tell us a little bit about your worst uh, investing mistake so far. Great one. So this just happened um, a few weeks back when I actually closed the position. So my, one of my biggest mistakes is actually um, Anju. It's one of the largest um, steel mill or Reba steel makers listed on Busa Malaysia. I opened uh, that position easily nine to 10 years back. Back then, um, Malaysia was undergoing quite a bit of transformation. There were a lot of news that um, you know, new townships are going to get built and you have the high-speed rail initiatives. Everyone was just harping about companies within the construction and infrastructure business. And naturally, that also includes the material company. So Andrew was one of them. It's a steel mill company that, you know, produces steel rebar. It was the best in, the cl in its class within Busan, Malaysia. So it was the steel mill that gave the best profit. It was the steel mill that gave the best free cash flow margin. But at the peak of it, uh, things started to, the, the big thesis of it didn't play out well. So we had a change of guard in terms of the government. A lot of projects were put on hold and share prices eventually fell um, from three ringgit all the way below one ringgit. I held on to it because the business isn't broken and I was waiting for the next cycle to come where the share price go up and I can, you know, exit my position. But I think they have actually um, put out news that they are raising capital because they wanted to you know, have much more working capital. And that for me was the final straw. They aren't really doing that well over the past, past few years. Even um, the business is generating negative free cash flow margin. And that's why I presume that um, the rights issues comes in. And rather than wait for a miracle for the share price to go back up to three ringgit, yeah, that was the loss I took to my book just a few weeks back. One of my biggest investing mistakes. There you have it. Thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I'm sure it's not easy, but uh, hopefully uh, all of us, the key thing is we learn from our mistake and, and uh, make sure we don't do it twice. Uh, okay, thank you so much. And next up, uh, let's have uh, John. Okay, great. Uh, Stanley, again, thank you for hosting us. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is John. Um, in a previous life, I was an engineer, um, and uh, anything that speaks or reeks technology uh, definitely like uh, interests me. But I found out very soon that uh, the best technology doesn't make the best investments. <laughs> so lesson one. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about, um, I would say a rather uh, boring 
and and boring is good. Uh, rather boring, uh, rather large. Con- uh, con- okay, I wouldn't say large in 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 the sense of Index Malaysia, but uh, rather large conglomerate. Um, the name of the company is called Mega First Corporation Berhad. And uh, when you, you when you listen to it, it doesn't even give you a hint on what what's the business they're doing, right? <laughs> mega first, so it's like mega, okay, large, and then first, and then so um, they're actually uh, quite a diversified conglomerate. Um, if you are interested to look at the ticker, it's three zero six nine, quite a, quite an on number, okay. Uh, listed in nineteen seventy, <laughs> of all things, right? Very very old. Uh, but what really led the turnaround was actually uh, a group led by uh, a serial entrepreneur called Mr. Go Nankyo took over in 2003. Okay? So at that point, uh, when he took over, uh, the business uh, that they had was also somewhat of a mixed bag. They had thermal power plants, one in uh, Sabah and one more in Shaoxing in China, both coal-fired. Uh, the second division uh they had this thing called the resource division it had uh quick limestone and they made calcium silicate bricks i didn't even know there was scientific name for bricks i just know bricks as bricks yeah but the third part of the business they have an automotive manufacturing business which was called block switch uh it had you know um geographically located in england malaysia and south africa today uh reportable divisions five but it's growing uh, and some of it, they deem like 100 million business, they deem too small to report. <laughs> so I keep on laughing whenever so they say that, right? <laughs> so just imagine the kind of size that they, they are looking for. So today is five business divisions. Uh, the biggest one is their renewable energy, which is a combination of hydro plus solar. Uh, they still have the resource division, one of the largest in Asia. So I'll talk about them a little bit later. Uh, they have packaging. They have property. Uh, and they consider it uh, so small that they, they stop reporting. <laughs> okay, even though they own a building in, in Petaling Jaya. Uh, they have the oleochemical, uh, which is uh, somewhat of an associate stake, a small stake. And they are moving into food security, which they just uh, reported uh, on a quarterly basis, just the recent uh, two quarters. Okay, And last but not least, they're going to hospitals. So, okay, uh, let's imagine uh, hydro, limestone... <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, uh, when the first time I met, I, 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 I looked at the company, I was like, okay, how to do valuation? <laughs> so uh, pretty interesting conglomerate. So uh, in terms of their competitive positioning, I mean, if you look at the five modes that we normally talk about, which is like a, a intangible asset, switching costs and all that, I can only think of three, but I'll start with these things first. Uh. Uh, the first words that come to mind when I think about MMCB, Shark Tank. Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah. Okay. Shark Tank, Berkshire Hathaway. And I'll explain why. Huh? Uh, Shark Tank is because Mr. Go gets and his team gets pitched every day. Almost oh. every other day. Okay. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway is because Berkshire uses an insurance float to actually fund a lot of the investments. So for uh, Megafirst, their float comes from hydro money. So they have a concession, a 25-year concession uh, by selling electricity to Cambodia uh, from Laos. And it's a 25-year concession that brings in roughly about 500 million a year. And that money is used to fund buying other businesses. So that's their float. So it's kind of like you have like kind of semi-permanent, almost permanent capital coming in, but it's not underwriting risk, lah, right? Um, secondly is the advantage of the structure. So you think of them, okay, it's kind of like a hybrid PE where most PEs that want to exit within three to five years, uh, these guys have proven over time that they are very, very long time PE, long gestation period. Like uh, Don Sahong, the hydropower plant that they own in uh, Laos, uh, 2008 was uh, kind of like the start, uh, only uh, producing money, revenue, 2020. So you think about it, no PE would be able to, to, to stand that kind of duration. Uh. Um, they also have a very excellent track record. I mean, before before Mr. Go uh, took over Mega First, he was in the brewery business. So my joke with Mr. Go every time I see him is that uh, in Hokkien we say Lu Hamid Sengi Be Which uh, literally translated is what business you don't know how to do. Because brewery also you do, property also you do. Uh, now they're moving into coconuts, uh, which I'll talk about after this. Uh. So <laughs> so um so of the five modes, uh, I see uh, very much it's an intangible, efficient scale and switching costs. Okay? Uh, between low cost production and network effects, I don't really see. 
but I also see three modes is because the ver uh, the variety of businesses they run. Yeah, because the concession business is is a con is intangible because there's a contract, there's a PPA to protect it, but also because of switching costs, you you can't switch out a hydropower plant producer, right? Uh, and in terms of efficient scale as a mode, I think their resources division uh, is one of the largest limestone quick, uh, quick lime producer in Asia, not just in Malaysia. So again, scale and plantation, um, this one is really scale. Uh, once fully planted, it will be one of the largest, if not the largest coconut plantation in the world. Not just Asia, it will be one of the largest in the world. But this is where every time he talks about coconut, I, I remember the joke that Warren Buffett said, you can't get uh, one baby in one month by making nine women pregnant. Lah. So there's a gestation period. You plant a coconut tree, it takes years to mature. And then, you know, so, so uh, very much uh, Warren Buffett's quotes come to mind. Lah. Talk about potential growth and catalyst. I think it's just Mr. Go's uh, entrepreneurial streak. Uh, he gets very sad on a Saturday and Sunday because it's not work day. Uh, he's itching to go back on a Monday. Uh, that's what a lot of people around him has told me. So he's like, he gets very like uh, uh, moody on a Friday lah, because there's <laughs> it's time time to rest. So he gets excited on a Monday, uh, but that's also something of a risk that we'll talk about later. Okay, uh, he's aided by uh, two able lieutenants, which are his key deal making team, but also a lot of experts around him lah. Uh, too long to name because different parts of the this business are. Uh, all the lieutenants in my name, I think half an hour. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> because you've got plastics, you've got limestone, you've got a coconut, you've got all this, right? Yeah. But his two key lieutenants in the HQ help him do the deal making. Uh, the second growth potential is really his five kids, four of them are in business. And uh, they, based on, you know, um, a very humbling experience meeting them and interacting with them, they all have very strict KPIs. And Mr. Go is known to be very hard on them harder than his own employees, which is kind of a good sign for shareholders, but may not be good for family. But okay, I leave that judgment to, to him, right? Um, and also, he has a, uh, Mr. Goh has a very big reputation uh, for being fair and also a value-driven uh, JV partner. So instead of him looking out for deals, people actually come and see him. And I've, I've, I've witnessed this firsthand a few times. Okay, uh, risk challenges. Uh, again, Mr. Goh, key man, his two lieutenants, even though the children are being groomed, it will take time. Okay, uh, A lot of them came over into the business probably over the past two to three years. The elder daughter may be a little bit longer, but yeah. Um, I think the next challenge for them really is this uh, thing that any business face, which is talent acquisition. So they don't do formal interviews. They don't have a, like a formal HR team as far as I know. <laughs> okay, So how they hire people is like friends of friends, get to know you over a few drinks, uh, see whether they have a track record of running businesses on their own, and then they partake in minority stake, let you prove your worth, and then they take on a more majority stake. That's how they do it. That's how they acquire talent. Lah. So I've seen one example where uh, this guy was an engineer, was helping him run, uh, he was working for the contractor, helping him run some projects, and I said, hey, after project finish, like <laughs> so, pop join. So that's how they acquire talent. It's a little bit organic, informal, but I think as you you're not a Google, you're not a Facebook. You know, you've got you know famous interview processes. They don't have that lah yet. Okay, uh, and last but not least, uh, two more two more uh, risks. One is is a diversified conglo. So a lot of financial institutions, when they look at it, very hard to value. You know, uh, you want to do a sum of parts, you want to do a DCF to equity, which part of the business, they'll ask you. Most likely, they will do the biggest part, which is the renewable energy. Yeah. Uh, the rest, how, how to account for coconuts that's not yet matured. You see, you can't do a DCF for that, right? Mm. <laughs> okay, and last but not least, uh, Don Sahong took 14 to 15 years to fruition. Um, it's going to be a struggle to find the next uh, float uh, yes. for, for um, Megafirst. Ah. Okay. Um, quick look at the numbers. Back then, 2003, when Mr. Go took over, top line, 377 million. Uh, profit after tax, 19, 80% was from the power plants. Shareholder equity, 224 million. Debt of 128. Okay, today, top line is 1.3, so 4x. Okay, uh, Profit after tax, 425, so that's roughly 20 times. Okay, uh, Shareholder equity from um, 224, today is 3. Uh, 3.5. <laughs> okay, so you go and calculate uh, how much. Uh, uh, and how many years is that? Uh? 
2003 until today. So you're talking about 21, 21 years. Yeah, 21 years. Okay. Yes, and uh, right now, free cash flow generation. This is the one that really a lot. I, I, it's like you see, most of the time, our struggle as capital allocators and investors is trying to predict efficient cash flow, right? Yes. This one is like chop sign deal twenty five years. So <laughs> it's a it's a B to G kind of agreement, you know, because unless the Lao government, you know, like decides to kick you out, lah. So it's like twenty five years of DCF that you can kind of predict, lah. Quite, quite with certainty. Uh, market cap, when they took over, oh, before that, uh, ROIC, return invested capital, roughly about low teens uh, from single digit. Right now, it's roughly about low teens since 2020. Market cap, when they took over 400 million, uh, today is 4.4. So if you're a shareholder since then, about 11 times uh, for a boring Malaysian conglomerate. Okay, um, Revenue segment, power generation makes up 50, 60%. Okay, so 1.3 top line. 600 million comes from power generation revenue. Packaging gives them about 400. Uh, their uh, resources gives, uh, sorry, uh, pack, resources gives them about 400, sorry. Packaging right now, it's about, uh, oh, sorry. Resources about 200. Packaging, the numbers are so small. <laughs> um, power generation 600. Packaging about 400 resources give them about 200 and the rest uh, the line line okay the line line um, in terms of valuation uh, quite unheard of lah, nine times today <laughs> trailing forward you talk about nine times if you compare an equivalent uh, hydro guys in Thailand like big grim you're talking about easily 15 20 times uh, this is about nine times probably I think that's the conglo discount that has been offered to them lah, in a way I think at the peak, they were probably uh, less than 20, no, about 20 times uh, in January 2020 during the COVID craze. That was about 20 times. But other than that, yeah, that's it. So investment thesis, bull and bear, uh, bear case. I think bear case is like, oh, the coconuts died. The hospital JB failed. Lao government, government just, kicked them out. <laughs> government kicked them out, you know. So <laughs> uh, a bit to line all the ducks up for the worst case scenario, there's quite diversified lah, risk. Lah, okay? uh, if, it's a bear, if it's a bull case, uh, top line should hit roughly about 1.6. Uh, free, uh, free cash flow roughly about five to 600 million. And then they have a streak where, you know, every time I host their quarterly briefings, uh, there's always this question of dividend when I started. And now the dividend questions has gotten uh, less and less. Because we keep on, uh, they keep on telling shareholders, uh, it's coming back to you, but later, you know, uh, because we have an ROIC, we, we want to plow back into the business and grow the business. So I think shareholders have actually matured to that as well. So yeah, that's it. Um, obviously, I didn't go into each division. Usually our quarterly briefings take about two hours <laughs> because each part of the division, 20, 20, 20, 20 minutes, then that's it, you know, never ending story. Then hospital, you know, you talk about, and then oleo, oh, sorry, oleo chemical, so they went in. So yeah, yeah. So right. questions. Why, John, I think this one, you said you presented a one company, right? I think you just presented like what, five to 10 companies right? in one package. <laughs> next, I'll let next, Mr. Go know. <laughs> next time I'll present something like QQQ, then I'll talk about 100 companies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one by one. One, one by, by one. Yeah, Let's yeah. start from Apple. <laughs> no, I, actually, I, I have one question uh, on, yes, on, on this company because uh, exactly it is a uh, conglomerate, right? Hmm. So I, I find it quite interesting and and challenging to to at least for the management uh, to manage the business because uh when we say let, let's say it gets a company with 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 in a specific sector right so you, you attract people that's already in that industry and they they know how to manage because certain industry is managed in a certain way right Correct. but when it comes to conglomerate it's like they are so diverse i don't think there are a lot of synergy uh among all, all these different business lines so how do they you know like manage this as as a whole in an efficient manner because I, i'm just drawing a parallel to let's say like Berkshire Hathaway right i think how um warren buffett managed the business is that he's very hands off and then let the every entity managers manage their own business and he, he also mentioned like famously mentioned uh for 
some of the CEO, he actually, the last time he spoke with them is like, it could be like two or three years back. Mm. You know, there's a business running without his in, in, involvement at all. That's how he managed like so many different businesses, right? Yes. Then the question is for, for this company, how, how do they manage this conglomerate? Very similar. And I'll, I'll give you, uh, I have to limit the stories because there's so many stories, uh, but I'll limit it to the biggest one. So, uh, okay, engineer being engineer. Okay, Don Sahong is a run of a river hydropower plant, uh, 260 uh, megawatt in terms of capacity. So one of the largest hydropower plants in um, the region and uh, in Malaysia is this thing called Bakun. So Bakun is 2.4 giga, 10, almost 10 times, uh, 8 times to 9. So, so when Don Sahong was awarded to Mega First, uh, guess what? What was uh, Mr. Goh's uh, first line of attack? <laughs> he went to find the guy that built Bakun, hired the guy, uh, this is eight times smaller. Uh, settle it for me, ah. Uh. Okay. So that 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 is how I, uh, is uh, one great example how I see they run the business. Secondly, Stenta, um, when he poured in money, he didn't buy uh, a majority stake. He was partnering with three other guys who were very hungry entrepreneurs that ran the business. And what what he does over time is this. Um, Actually, he said this many, many times, and I, 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 I love it as an entrepreneurial business lesson. He said, the guy who holds the highest risk should always hold the highest upside. That means you cannot have an asymmetrical risk that this guy puts in sweat equity. Yeah, he may not have the money, but then he's, he, it's his only business, or if the business goes bankrupt, then he only enjoys like 10% of the upside. So... I reflected on that many, many times when I see or I study serial acquirers, you know, like exactly like what you asked, Bunti, you know. Even if you see serial acquirers like Constellation Software, they're very much in software. A lot of synergy, a lot of things. But this is like coconut, <laughs> limestone. So what, what I found is he, he runs uh, it very similar to Berkshire, uh, very hands-off. But you know what happens or not, ironically, because it's hands-off. The guys who run this business, these businesses individually, they love Mr. Ghost's wisdom. They seek him out rather than he go and check on them. And I think that's a very healthy relationship because sometimes Mr. Go just goes in and backs financially. So I know certain deals that he go in, he says, okay, I trust these guys. Um, they have the right attitude already presented, uh, right, right track record. We financially back you up. Okay. And then uh, we take a minority stake because you are taking a bigger stake. And then he lets them flourish, uh, pretty much hands off. He would just come in when he is summoned to ask for advice. That's it. So I think that's one of the strengths. But at the same time, uh, since you mentioned that, the deal making is very much concentrated at head office right now. So what a few of our my, my fund manager friends, we were talking and we were saying that, how can we scale that or process that? You know, like if you look at companies like Amphenol, they have like a proper M&A team, or Constellation, they have a proper... It's not just Mark Leonard doing everything, you know. So he trains his guys and then they go and templatize this. Uh, that's something that uh, we look forward to, you know, having uh, MFCD do that as well. Hopefully his kids or some of his lieutenants can, can take over. Most of the time right now, it's still very concentrated at HQ. Lah. Yeah. So, yeah, I better stop here. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah. JP, you have any questions? Not really, though. So... When John mentioned that he's going to pitch this company, at least from my side, my mom has been harping on me on it. <laughs> but due to, you know, so many companies to analyze. Has your mom been talking to John? <laughs> oh, I won't be surprised if that's oh, listening to my videos. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask her to join the next quarterly. It's open to the public, okay? <laughs> but but um, I'll make sure that... Um, she does not temper too much with the stock now that you know i know that she's holding it and yeah, there's yeah, still yeah. late uh, for potentially for the company to run but it also motivates me to do a bit of analysis on my side to get back to her request uh, <laughs> that has been delayed for the time being for god knows how long is it <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. great uh, yeah, while you're talking, I was just making a lot of notes because so many business, I, I got very confused. Uh. Yeah, uh, trust me, bro. Same for me when I first started <laughs> analyzing this business. <laughs> but uh, basically what you described is very, very similar to, to Berkshire. Like you That's said, right. right? Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, we can, if you want to name it as the Berkshire or Malaysia, uh, of course, we can, must always compare with the other company that uh, people like to comp see it as a Berkshire or Malaysia, right? So mm. like maybe YTL. Mm. So, or Sunway Group. Yeah. How, how do you compare 
you know, to these bigger guys, uh, where, where is the unique point in, in Megaverse compared to, to them? I think uh, if you look at, uh, and I, I say this without any malice, lah, um, if you look at a lot of Sunway or YTL's revenue, it's very much been, okay, with the exception of YTL because they have Wessex Water in UK and, and also uh, Saraya, Saraya yeah. Power Plant in Singapore, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Mega First's revenue has largely been derived overseas. I don't know if you noticed. Like the power plant, it's like understanding um, ge di different geographical, uh, different political risk and all that kind of thing. And I think because of that, they've developed a mentality very much like Yinsen, the you know, FAF. Yinsen doesn't have much or probably only one, like FAS or Helang, which is in Malaysia, right? The rest is everything else overseas. So I think that's where I feel it's slightly differentiated from the Sunway and the YTL groups. Secondly, a lot of YTL and Sunway groups revenue were uh, derived from construction, a lot of the construction business. Uh, whereas if you look at where uh, Mega First's team today, food security, I mean, prior to COVID, no one even thought about it, right? And uh, today... And if you look at even like for the next five years, there's a lot of dependency of imports for food uh, within Malaysia. That's something that, you know, I, I don't see the other conglos going at that has potential to return, but long gestation periods. They've always stuck to within the construction business, within property development, within, uh, for the lack of a better word, and again, I said this without many malice intent, it's a, a lot of patronage business. Uh. So I, I see that's where uh, Megafirst can differentiate itself. Secondly, also, I think in terms of partnering people, I think this is where Megafirst really stands out. Mm -hmm. I think uh, if you look at the hospital business, it wasn't even an idea that they had. It was someone, a group of doctors that went to see them. So again, they had to evaluate the economics of it and, and, and nail down the, the nitty-gritty mechanisms. But it's something that when you are, of, you are known in the industry to be fair, people come look for you rather than you go source out for deals. And when that happens, then you see the camaraderie, the trust. It's a little bit different. That's how I would say. Yeah. Rather than, you know, you're a big conglo, you see an interesting company and it's more like either a takeover or hostile takeover kind of thing. This is like people, hey, come, you know, I want to partner you. It's different. Lah. It's different. Yeah. I don't know whether it makes sense to you guys, but that's how, that's my observation. Obviously, uh, there's some bias because I'm a shareholder, so uh, upfront and declare. <laughs> so, but at the same time, I think that's something that I, I observed differently from the question. And it was a great question, to be yep. honest. Yep. I, I think, I think from, from what you uh, explained, uh, give, me the, uh, give me the sense that they are, number one, they are, they're contrarian when, when they uh, go into the kind of business they want. Mm. Uh, and also, they definitely already have some sort of a reputation in the market. That's right. Where people seek them out, lah. That's uh, right. But we have to talk about, you know, the 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 key risks uh, of the business. You know, since that you say most decision is still done in HQ, of the what do you think of the key man risks and uh, has there been succession plan in, in place? From what I know, um, I think uh, the children are being groomed uh, by both the lieutenants, Mr. Go has, uh, as well as uh, these guys are no pushovers, ah. The lack of a better, and I'm not saying this to get any merit or brownie points from them. Um, I happen to know and interact with them on uh, quite a regular basis. I'm in admiration by the values that have been inculcated from the family, mm -hmm. and I say this, you know, with with absolute sincerity because when you deal with uh, usually family or second and third generation, there's always this worry of sense of entitlement or whatever. Uh, you, you don't see that at all in the family. And uh, like, as I said, from the stories I've heard, Mr. Go is even harder on his children to perform because he knows that the responsibility he's passing on to them uh, is going to be big. And I think that's where uh, hopefully it will alleviate the succession planning. Uh, secondly, uh, obviously it's not my place to tell them how to run a business, uh, but if they can come up with an ESOS scheme, which they don't have right now, I think that could be an attractive way of accelerating that talent retention or talent acquisition. But again, it's a chicken and egg, you know, because you give ESOS too early, it's given in perpetuity, you cannot pull it back. But then if you give it too late, the guy may lose patience, you know, he may be a good operator, a good capital locator, but then he lose patience and he, he might want to leave. So it's always this chicken and egg uh, problem, uh, issue, uh, Stanley. I understand.
Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Uh, anyone welcome. have a uh, last question for John? Nope. Okay, then then before we move on to the next one, but uh, just ask you on this uh, your personal question first, so that everyone can get to know you a little bit more. Uh, let why don't you share with us your worst investing mistakes so far? Okay, uh, many investing mistakes, but I think uh, I'll start off with the the most famous one. It really was apparent during COVID, which is everybody can fly. <laughs> <laughs> I think I watch you. Watch your videos well enough to know <laughs> which company you're going to talk about. <laughs> uh, so I, I have a tagline, uh, Juparin. It, it says, everybody can fly. And it, it's followed by an attached with everybody can wait. Yes. Because uh, <laughs> your, your flight is never delayed. It is with time. Mm. Yeah. So um, I think at that point of time, when I looked at the business and looked at the, uh, the low-cost airline business, the company I'm talking about is Asia. <laughs> The hypothesis was um, Southeast Asia, archipelago, you know, islands, you, you're not going to get there by boat, you're going to have planes. And one thing I actually downplayed was actually the unit economics of fuel. Um, yes, it makes up 50-60%, I should have been well aware, but uh, what actually captured uh, my enthusiasm at that point in time is for them to turn that lever on and off to get free cash flow was just stop taking on planes in CapEx. But as I understood, and I'm a bit of an aviation geek myself, I love planes, uh, just for the fun of it. Um, anything older than five, I mean, you look at US airlines, right? Anything more than five or 10 years old, that plane is going to gas fuel. And you have but no choice, but a perpetual cycle of just CapEx replenishment every three to five years. It doesn't help that... Um, there's only a monopoly of two plane manufacturers. And it also doesn't help that you can't bring in that capacity any faster because if you lease, then your cost, leasing cost goes up, all these kind of things. Uh, and I think last but not least, um, I think Tony marketed the company very well. Pivot, he said he would pivot to digital and all that. But at the core, you're really still an airline. And airline unit economics is something that more and more I'm like very afraid when you have a race to the bottom because... I think Jupan, you 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 see my previous video, right? Airline prices, uh, air ticket prices never it goes. It thinks we think it go up, but it's actually it's not. It's, it's coming down because of inflation. You see, so yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you yeah. for sharing. Thanks. Interesting uh, mistake, but uh, <laughs> a lot of lessons there in uh, inside. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, then last company, uh, I'll be presenting it. And uh, just a quick introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Stanley, and uh, I have been uh, blogging about finance for, for many, many years. And uh, right now, I'm a wealth advisor with IFAS Global Market uh, in Malaysia. And of course, you can find out more about uh, all those and what I do uh, at learnwithstanley.com. And uh, today, I'm going to talk about, since already we have uh, two companies listed on the US, and we talk about one Malaysia company. Company. And I will be talking about a company that is both listed in Hong Kong and also in the US market. Mm. <laughs> and this company is uh, Yum China. And yeah, they are listed in Hong Kong. The ticker is 9987. And uh, on the New York Stock Exchange is uh, YUMC, Yum China. So, disclosure I don't own this company right now. Uh, but it's, it's a company that I've been following for a while and uh, one of the better business model that I like uh, for businesses in China. Lah. Right now, the market cap is about 15 billion US dollars and uh, they basically uh, owns the, uh, the, the branding uh, restaurant for KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, all in China, right? So um, they are a spin-off from, from, from Yam uh, brands directly. Uh, it has a very, very long history in China, actually. Uh, they opened their first KFC in 1987. So that's even before oh. Tiananmen uh, Square incident. Uh, so very, very localized already. Right? It's run by a completely localized uh, management. So the restaurant is uh, quite, quite localized, although the branding is still uh, KFC. Um, in 2016, they, because of the trade uh, trend tension, they completely spin off as an independent company. Mm. So now they're not owned by uh, young brands at all. They just have uh, similar shareholders and uh, it's a completely different company. Um, and what they have is basically uh, a, a, a agreement 
a rights of use of agreement for 50 years of licensing for all the brands under YAM. Uh, and it's auto renewal. So when it's finished, they still have the rights to renew it uh, for all the YAM brands portfolio now and future uh, for the Greater China region. And Greater mm. China includes Taiwan as well in this case. And what Yam's parent, uh, the Yam brands uh, in, in US will get is a 3% uh, royalty from the sales of, uh, of everything. So right now, uh, Yam China is the largest restaurant chain in China by revenue. Uh, it has roughly about 14,000 plus stores China-wide. Uh, main one, of course, is still KFC with uh, 10,000 stores of KFC. Yeah. Next one is Pizza Hut, about 3,000. And then the rest is uh, split among uh, some of their own brands and also some of, uh, uh, including Taco Bell. Also. So they have Taco Bell, they have their own brands called uh, uh, Leadership and uh, Huang Di Huang, which is a Chinese restaurant, like maybe uh, Paradise Inn or Imperial Treasure kind of uh, restaurant chain. Uh, they also have a joint venture coffee chain with Lavazza uh, of the Italy. So this is a complete JV with, with Lavazza uh, directly from, from Italy. And what is unique about this company is the entire Yam China group employs uh, close to half a million people in China. <laughs> yeah, so the employee size is about 500,000 people. So, uh, which is also a reason why I think I... I, 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 I I kind of uh, feel a little bit safer for with this company because they're such a big employee. I think the government won't be so keen to tamper with its business so easily, lah, right? They have to think about uh, all the people working for them. It's and like a GLC, yes. <laughs> <laughs> some, uh, I, I would say they have some bargaining power with the, <laughs> with the, with the government, lah, maybe. <laughs> uh, in my mind, lah, at least. Uh, and what I like it is, is uh, it continue to be a big dividend player, a payer and a huge share buybacks, right? About 75% of operating profit is plowed back into div either dividends or share buyback uh, right now. Uh, competitive position, I feel that brand-wise uh, for fast food restaurant chain, the brand is uh, quite unanimous, lah, right? People know what is KFC, what is Pizza Hut, and they have a strong uh, brand and localization brand. The The local management is very, very strong. Uh, more or less, they have already lo uh, localized all the restaurant concept. KFC China, for example, uh, they serve 50 items, 50 menu items in their menu, right? Not like our KFC or the US, just simple. Lah. So it's like a Chinese restaurant already, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, you have 50, 50 items. Uh, and um, the management has shown that they are very, very quick on their thinking, uh, especially during COVID time. Mm. They completely revamped, uh, not, not say revamped, they're already uh, big on tech, but they move very, very quickly into online ordering and online delivery, right? So much so that I think even until today, 50% uh, of their sales coming from delivery for, wow. for KFC, la, right? Um, and they have embraced uh, all the tech necessary, uh, 98% of all payment now throughout all their restaurant is done digitally. And their app is uh, more or less uh, 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 not a simple, uh, their app is considered like a super app uh, where you do the ordering, uh, pick up, uh, delivery, your customer service, you want to complain, you can complain in the app, uh, your royalty program, everything is inside the app, mm. right? And across uh, for all, all their brands. Most of their stores right now, uh, of the 14,000 plus, uh, it's actually self-operated. So they don't really do franchise that much. Uh, as some areas, they have like a local partner uh, as, a, as a minority shareholders or, or you know, in, 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 the, in those chains. Uh, they only franchise about 20% of their stores right now. So mostly self-operating. Self, uh, um, so they can uh, scale up a lot, you know, not just in the restaurant, in the whole supply chain, in the warehousing, uh, they can plan everything out lah, very well. Uh, CEO is a lady called Joey Wat, uh, a Hong Konger. And right now she's only about 52 of age. So I feel that still quite a big runway for her and her team, you know, to continue what they're doing, um, opening stores. So at what, just share with you guys what is the kind of scale 
of growth they are doing. La, right? um, I already mentioned they are the largest restaurant chain business right now. Uh, and the entire restaurant chain business in, in China is estimated to be about 700 billion uh, US dollars. It's a $700 billion US uh, market size. Uh. And Yam China, already the biggest, their revenue is only around $11 billion right now. Yeah, so only. Less, yeah, less than 2% <laughs> of the entire market. Uh. They own maybe 1% one, one plus percent of the entire market. Uh, I guess the second biggest chain uh, will be Haiti Lao. Haiti Lao do about $6 billion, uh, about half the size of them. Uh, and compared to, say, a developed market in the US or in Korea, uh, fast food, ch- uh, not fast food chain, but restaurant chain, like big chain, can take up about 40% of the entire market. Right? Mm. So in China now, more than 90 plus, uh, I guess 80 to 90% is still mom and pop shop, your own mom and pop restaurant. Uh, whereas the chain has a very, very small market share. Whereas mm. in the developed market, that's, that's actually you know, on, on the flip side. And their plan right now is to grow from uh, the current uh, 14 to 15,000 stores uh, to add another 20,000 stores by 2023, uh, 2030. Yeah. And they are building up. So I plan to. They, are, they plan. They plan to add, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, They plan to add up to 20,000 restaurants by 2030. So that means they are adding roughly about 1,500 stores a year, right? Mm. So every day they have to open three stores. uh. About every day they open three stores in China. (laughs) And and what what they're targeting here is a 10% store growth rate. So every year growth of 10% of stores. Um, And they want to, so basically... By the time they reach that 20,000 stores, they will be able to serve about 700 million people in China. And that's still just half of China. Mm. So even by then, they are just serving half of China, right? And then they, maybe they'll go on to the next growth uh, target. So, and a, a, a restaurant chain, for a, for a restaurant, when they open, the break-even period is about two, two years for them. So it's a very big, a good ROI business, uh. Right. So I feel that as long as they can execute well, it's a very kind of a Lego type of business where they already have all the formula. You just duplicate it over and over and over again. Um, th- but there are some risks. There are some risks mainly, okay, for, for one example, the US-China tension, right? On and off, you'll see China patriotism uh, boil up uh, if something happened. And when that happened, they boycott the foreign brands. Uh, mm. Typically, we see this quite short-lived, lah, or, uh, on and off, but it can have a, quite a drastic uh, impact if it happens. Um, the, second, the, the, the second but most biggest risk, of course, is still the government. So it's still a China business, and anything happens, you know, the, the, the government must be happy. So, but so far, there has never been a major uh, crackdown on the restaurant business lah, by, by the Chinese government. So that, that's good. Um, but of course, they they have dif- uh, similar. They have uh, on- ongoing risks like food safety, uh, labor strike. You know, since they are one of the biggest employer in China, and also they have to depend on Yam Brands' reputation. Uh. So if anything mm-hmm. happens to Yam Brands directly and, and damage the the brands uh, that they have, uh, it will affect them also because they are not the brand owner. Um, another interesting. A risk on them is actually extra tax because they still run as the like the uh the the VIC structure. What's the what's the structure? Oh, uh, VI, uh, variable in, uh, interest entity. Yeah, so the VIE structure. So they are already taxed uh about 25 percent in China, and mm. but when they uh, repatriate uh the the profit back to US for dividend or even for share buybacks they'll get another additional 10% tax. Uh. So mm. they are being taxed much more than, than everybody else uh, on that. So these are some of the risks that I guess we have to take note. Uh, so not a company that is completely risk-free. Uh, in terms of financial, right, uh, it has a lot of debt for this company that they run, but it has also a lot of cash. So what I mean is it has 2.7 uh, billion US dollars of debt on the books, uh, but uh, also equal amount of cash. 
So they keep a lot of debt, but actually they, it is offset by the, by the cash. Uh. Free mm. cash flow is always positive almost every year. Revenue growth in the last decade has been around 5% in US dollar term. They report in US dollars. So mm. I guess some of it is uh, 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 eaten back because of the depreciation of the renminbi. Uh, mm. Profit though, grow last decade about 13%. But choppy, uh, it is not a straight line for their, for their um, profit, especially during COVID period, it sk skewed the result a, a little bit. Uh, ROE for the business is about 15% on average, uh, but net, in, net margin is only about 8%. So it's not a very highly profitable business, but uh, still good at a uh, uh, return on on capital um, hmm. but w one good thing which is good is that they run on a negative cash conversion cycle hmm. because they collect cash and they are, all, all their expenses is delayed so they, they, they don't really need a lot of cash in hand to run but uh, interestingly they, they do have a lot of cash in hand uh, maybe as a safety net valuation wise it's a dividend counter so they do give dividend but as a US stock they only give about 1.66%. Mm. So if you want to avoid the the tax, the, the withholding tax, of course, go for the Hong Kong shares. Then there's no withholding tax on that. So you get the 1.66% yield. Uh, they also should buy back uh, on it. Especially these past two years, they have, they have been buying back very, very ag aggressively. Lah. Um, maybe they feel the share price is low, but I, I don't know. But that, that is something on and off they'll do. Uh, PE-wise, Okay, so again, this is as a caveat, I think similar to Bunti. Uh, I think valuation, especially coming to China stocks, uh, uh, sometimes it, it, it seems cheap or, you know, in all logic it's cheap, but it doesn't, you know, I think valuation is not that important in China. <laughs> right? It still have to go to a lot of the sentiment. And I think in the large part, uh, foreign investors in China stock, I think the, the sentiment is completely not there. Yeah. Uh, and if the sentiment don't return, uh, I, I I think you know it doesn't matter how cheap the valuation is. But having said that, the valuation right now PE is around eighteen times still, uh, but still already cheaper than their five year average, uh, which is about twenty six to twenty eight percent, twenty eight times uh, typically. Because mm. for for long term restaurant, very uh, very stable business, you know, having a twenty plus times PE, I think that's quite reasonable. Uh, so th that's, that's roughly it. Uh, it's a stable, strong business with proven management. Uh, big addressable market still, you know, in our lifetime, I think they, I don't think they can saturate the market. Mm. Uh, and strong financially, valuation, if you want to look at it, is uh, still okay. Uh, and in a less politically charged uh, industry, lah where, you know, the, the, the Chinese government, I feel it, this is one of the last few industries that they, they will feel that their political influence is being being being, being attacked uh, by this company becoming too big. Uh. Yeah. So Maybe sometimes it's like, you know, suddenly they think about health concern and they want to, <laughs> you know, go and scrutinize the menu. Could uh, that happen? <laughs> Possible, possible, but I think with fifty item on the menu, uh, they should have some healthy stuff like that. Like. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, one thing I, I think about is also uh, because we talk about uh, all our stock, we try and match it to the performance of S and P five hundred, mm. right? And this uh, stock will be very, very uh, non correlated with S and P five hundred because it's not not even in the list. And as a China stock, um, plus you know. Is, is outside of the ETF uh, universe. Uh. So I feel mm. you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a good diversifying tool uh, as, as a stock. So go ahead, your questions. Um, yep. per perhaps in, in some sense, uh, I would like to start off with a question about value chain. From, from what you've just described, they've kind of localized a lot of uh, the, the fried chicken. Mm -hmm. uh, and... and Actually, there's this some some strange observation that uh, some of my friends tell me fried chicken in New Zealand, uh, Malaysia, and everyone, it tastes different. Mm. I don't know how, but it does. Okay, and that leads me to my question, which is: if you look at the value chain, are a lot of their raw ingredients uh, sourced within China? Would would you be able? Do they disclose that? And uh, on 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 that related matter, what is what do you think are the multiplier effects if and when the Chinese government come and clamp down? Would that be something that they would 
think or be con uh, conscious about because it's it's not just it's not just the yum brands or the KFC is impacting, but you know the suppliers and all that kind of thing. What what, do you, what are your thoughts? Mm, yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, my understanding is they 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 source predominantly locally, and since all the ingredient is is produced in China anyways, mm. uh, that that actually seems to be the most logical and and the most effective way lah. They have already built up a very very intensive uh logistic and warehousing supply chain for for their business. So uh, that's actually a plus point for them at the back end that mm. they can they can do everything at scale and at a much uh, better efficiency compared to the rest. Uh. Mm, in terms of risk, uh, maybe you want to elaborate why, why would the government clamp down on, on, on that? Yeah, I, I was thinking it, not so much about why. It's like, would this uh, supply chain or value chain, because there's so much sourced locally, do you think that is a hindrance for the government to clamp down? Because that's uh, one of the political risks that you talked about, about sentiment, about whether government can will come down and clamp, you know. So yeah. the, the the hypothesis I was trying to lead towards or to, to seek your view on is that because consumer products are really the everyday man problem, mm. uh, it is less prone to, let's say, an Alibaba or a Tencent being clamped down by the government. Lah. Would that be a, a point for, for preventing the government to clamp down too much? Of course, I cannot speak for the Chinese government. Yeah. <laughs> if you can, if you can, we'll all be your very nice friends. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in my mind, at least, I, I, I see no reason for mm. them to truly disrupt the business. Uh, unless of what Bunti mentioned just now, right? If mm. they start to think about the health of the of the people, uh, bionic chickens or you know yeah. hormone fed chickens that you know, uh, or that maybe is... just too much fried food, lah. <laughs> <I don't> think... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, but, uh, so that could be an angle. So I think for yeah, no matter what, uh, investing in China, you cannot discount the government. Basically, mm. I would say that uh, go in with the go in with the mentality that the main stakeholder in any investment in China is the government first, right? So, whatever company that you want to invest, you have to be there to understand that the Chinese government is there. Mm. Uh, it's a risk you have to take. It's a partner you you have to partner with. That's, that's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So keep keep your allocation small. <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer. <laughs> disclaimer. So I, I wanted to ask the questions related to the risk that, that Stanley you just mentioned, right? Which is the national patrioti mm. patriotism. Mm. So I don't know about your area, Stanley. Um like have you went to let's say like Starbucks or KFC near your place in the last six months or twelve months? Because mm. in, in Malaysia, right, uh there's this, you know, the boycott of all these Western brands. I don't know. I think it probably is like by areas, but I just share my experience, right? Because uh, my hometown is from uh, Pahang, Kuantan. Mm. So I, I I visited Kuantan just a few months back. Now, and then we visited the KFC place, right? So it's really, really scary. Mm. If you think about when you look at the scene, right? And then you're thinking that if I own this place, right? Wow, mm. really jialat kind of situations. It's like, you know, it's, when you enter, you can go to the counter and order and then... Upper go go upstairs. You can still have plenty of seats, right? Yeah. And uh, I went there with with my families, and it's like we you know booked the entire place. You know, it's yeah. like totally no <laughs> customer at all. Yeah. But yeah. I think this one is like depending on maybe KL or or Johor, maybe not not as bad. But in in my places where there's uh, larger Malay populations, right, it can be quite uh, serious. And I heard that quite a number of uh, all these you know KFC, Starbucks, they they just close. And I, I even chatted with a Malay friends and said, uh, wow, I'm quite surprised. You are the only one here. Like mm. they said it's like that. Because you know, when these all these national patriotism s situations occurs, right? Uh, you know, there are people will be there just to scold other customers that went into the stores, you know. Yep. They, they, they have, you know, they they will uh, it will it will spiral, you know. So just want to know your experience. Have you what yeah, encountered uh, these kind of things. Yeah, I can I can only speak from the places I, I visited, but but you're right. You know, I experienced the same thing. The boycott is real. You can you know even in in news news article we saw that the restaurant is also complaining themselves that they they have seen their revenue drop quite significantly. Um, yeah, it's is the sad truth. Uh, but I guess the, this this will happen. Uh, 
on on and off. But the sad thing, at least for Malaysia case, is that most of the people working in 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 the KFC and the, and the Starbucks are 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 our our Malay uh, pet, uh, friends as well, right? So yep. they end up uh, they are the one being affected also. So, but uh, but like you said, yeah, this in terms of uh, for for Yum brands uh, for for Yum China case. Uh, I I can totally foresee something similar happening as well mm. when you know uh, something uh, happened between say the US and and China, uh, you know Donald Trump say something that slight <laughs> slighted China. <laughs> uh, I could totally see that uh, happening. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, probably to also top up uh, on the questions that uh, John and Punti asked just now. So I previously worked in the fast food uh, factory, so a factory freezing fast food materials in Malaysia, so during all my internship. So surprisingly to know that a lot of the meat products are sourced from China as well. So I would presume that China has the capability to supply the raw materials, especially the proteins um, to young China. So it shouldn't be a big issue from, from that aspect. And I think after going through investing in China for the last few years, there are some sort of key principles in my mind if I want to consider a China Chinese company or Chinese investment is that what they do must not eventually go against CCP principle and we all know what CCP principles are, right? Mm, mm. Yeah. And for a fast food company um, I won't foresee, foresee too much of that uh, coming to play, although I won't totally discount the possibility of it, but compared to the likes of the big techs over there, I think um, in terms of relativity-wise, safer. Now, uh, I really don't have much. Uh, I think only the concern that I have it would be would be the union, because we have seen a lot of uni unionization um, from the workers' side. In many parts of the world, Starbucks has been experiencing it a lot uh, on the US side. And would something similar um, happen to Yams China? And you also mentioned that they have um, started the coffee initiative by partnering with La Baza. And coffee is a huge crazy thing right now in China as well. You have you know, existing players. You have Starbucks also going in there. And... Coffee, coffee is there. Even the tea players are, you know, upping up their game. So the, the consumers are not spoiled for choices. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I'm pretty sure the fast food scene wise, um, yeah, I'm trying to say, but pivoting or, or diversifying, diversifying out from that. How do you see that um, going for for them going to a space that's relatively challenging and and can be cutthroat? Yep. Uh. Yeah. So. Uh... Like you said, the coffee in the coffee space in China is uh, getting quite crowded, and this is actually not their first time venturing into coffee. They tried by to go in by themselves before, uh, and within a few years they failed lah. They I think they grew to a few hundred stores and then realized they cannot sustain it, so they closed everything down and then started this joint venture with Lavaza. Uh, directly so far uh, it seems to be encouraged quite encouraging the the numbers um, but I would say that everything is done in a, in a quite safe experimental met method uh. so they limit how much they invest uh, they try it out if it works then they expand you know it's not like they're not pumping uh, unlimited money to make sure it works. So to them, it's a, it, to, to them is they have this cash cow with KFC and Pizza Hut predominantly, and with the cash flow coming in, they're just experimenting with a few things, right? So even for their own brand like uh, the Leadership and the Huang Ti Huang, um, they try a few stores. I think at up to now they have like six hundred plus stores with, uh, for for those, um, but they're not really aggressively growing those. So even until now, most of the grow a uh, new uh, store opening is still Pizza Hut and KFC. So that mm. will continue to be the main focus of growth for them. The rest is just experimenting and seeing which one stick, which one doesn't stick. Yeah. Mm. Cool, cool. So I think just a fun fact: um, whenever I go to McDonald's or KFC, right, 
I always ask myself, why am I going back to these places, even though I'm pretty sure I've tasted better burgers outside of uh, McDonald's and also better fried chicken. But I think it always comes down to a few factors. So the band diagram, right? So what is delicious? What gives you satisfaction? And also what is cheap? I just realized that McDonald's and KFC is just right you know, for me. Mm. And that is why I always find myself like patronizing KFC or McDonald's at around one, once a month. Mm. So that's why I'm like, okay, this is something that I think won't go wrong. Uh, it's also a bit of a nostalgic kind of feeling because I think back then during our <laughs> kids' days, that was the go-to happy food. Right? Must have a lot of good memories. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Jupan, I think they lace a lot of it with drugs on the side. There's a there's a recurring, you know. Addiction to it, right? Yeah, you good factor. It's like you know the sate kajang. They tell you in Malaysia, they say sate kajang. There's a lot. I I won't go into details here because what they put in the kua and all that kind of thing. But anyway, just jokes aside. Jokes, jokes. There's someone from KFC watching this. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, thank you so much for all your, you know, uh, detailed explanation on on the stock that you are uh, you are you are researching on, and thank you so much for sharing them, and giving such detail into each each of them, your thought process about them. Um, before we we go, I will go describe each stock again, and yep. then uh, we will disclose by just raising our hand to see if you own yep. this stock lah, right? To to mm. show everybody. Uh, let's start yeah. with the first one, uh, Caterpillar. Do, do, wait, 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 yeah, yeah, wait, wait. Go come. Stanley, you want to go for your one mistake. largest mistake? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Make mistake, ah. Conveniently left out. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, I I forgot that one. I think I shared this story before. Uh, but uh, my biggest mistake is actually not one of mm, a monetary per se la. But it's the one that I remember the most, uh, and, and and regretted the most, and it changes my entire uh, investing philosophy. Uh, previously, I was a very band gram investor, so I go for net net. I look at the newspaper. Mm. Okay, last time still got newspaper at the fifty two week low uh, with the lowest one. I, I'll research that one first. Mm. <laughs> That's how I find my stock. Uh. And mm. of course, a lot of the stock will be rubbish stocks, right? Uh, yeah. when, when they are they're at that list. And I found this company called in Singapore called Arata Lifestyle. It's a S stock, right? Uh, a China stock that uh, say that they are in the menswear, menswear retailing and manufacturing. Uh. So it was selling at net cash Right, I think uh, I can't remember, but I think almost like just half of cash, half of net oh. cash position. So very very cheap. I just bought into it, and then within a few months, uh, within a few months, the company called for a rights issue. Not rights issue. Uh, is it rights? No, they come for call for a convertible bonds issue, convertible oh. bonds issue at an interest rate of fifteen percent or something. Ah, uh, when it is net cash, uh, when the company is already <laughs> net cash, so it doesn't make sense. Right, so I went to the EGM, and then I can see the C- CF uh, CFO was completely smoking everybody lah, uh, completely smoking everybody, and uh, all the shareholders was getting smoke, uh, <laughs> getting mm. smoke, right? And uh, I left, I left the uh, the meeting feeling like an idiot, uh, basically. Mm. I I feel that you know, uh, after investing for so many years, I still fall for this kind of companies but, and yeah. uh, have to. Tra- travel all the way to go to the EGM and get fit a, a bunch of uh, BS mm. and from Stanley, that yeah sorry do, do, when you f- when you realize that it's all bunch of BS right mm. do you think that you are the, the minority that realize this or do you think that other people also realize good question mm. I think other people realize it but definitely there's a subgroup of people who refuse to realize what they realize yeah. okay. right okay. they still you know still hold on to it but uh, during that meeting, I, I walk out. I walk out halfway, lah. Basically, I walk out halfway, and uh, I, I saw it uh, on the, in the lobby of the hotel. I saw it, uh, <laughs> and then uh, well, very fast, yeah. And then uh, I com- um, I didn't uh, basically. I completely changed my investment philosophy after that. Right? I, mm. I I go for quality first, which is what I stick to until today. And Great. anything that 
you know, when I look at, I start with the point of, uh, is it a stock that I want to own for the long term, regardless mm. of the valuation? Uh. So yeah. that 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 completely changes my my investing style, and I, I'm grateful for it, lah. Although I I make the mistake. Okay. Great sharing. Thanks yeah, for I mean, sharing. Yeah. Great. Uh, where were we? Okay. Uh, so we, we I'll, I'll give a su- disclosure a summary disclosure. of uh, the stock that we talk <coughs> about, and then we disclose. Okay. Mm. Uh, so Caterpillar. A uh, very strong brand company that is able to grow their e- its EPS uh, for the long term, uh, even its margin, uh, and it has been beating the S and P five hundred. Right? Who owns yeah. Caterpillar? Hey, nobody. You probably don't know, lah. We talked for so long. Be <laughs> so passionately. <laughs> <laughs> this one, uh, this is the bonus for those who watch until the end. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay, then uh, next but one. I would, I would go, I would go yeah. and say that um, I would be intrigued and interested to initiate a long position okay. at the right price. Yes. Okay. Mm. okay. No yeah. pressure, bro. No, no pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just right now, right now. Uh, next one is uh, it's a conglomerate. Uh, Deemed as the Berkshire Hathaway of Malaysia Mega First. Like who owned this company? Oh, okay. My mom. <laughs> <laughs> and Jumpama. As disclosure. And Jumpama. Okay. Yeah, I need to, uh, need to disclose. <laughs> uh, okay. Very good. And, and next by, one. By way of uh, mutual interest. Okay. Mutual interest. <laughs> <That's why. laughs> watch, watch your video, lah, surely. <laughs> yeah. Um, next one is uh, the stock that all of us. Love to love, uh, Nvidia, who owns this stock? Ah, uh, okay, 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 see. Oh, okay. Uh, four, four, four. Okay, so Nvidia, yeah. we all own it. Uh, and last one, uh, the KFC of China, Yam China, who owns this company? Okay, I also don't own this company. <laughs> Just <laughs> something I'm looking at. <laughs> okay, uh, great, uh, good, good segment for for that one and. Remember that uh, we're, we're going to be tracking the performance of all this stock uh, for the next year. And you can find out the, uh, the Excel sheet uh, and uh, in real time how, how, how it's performing against the S&P 500 uh, from our website, from my website, uh, learnwithstanley.com. So thank you so much, uh, all of you guys, for joining. Before we go, why don't we go around and you can share a little bit about uh, if someone wants to connect with you, where can they find you? Uh, Jumpat, maybe you start first. Yeah, sure. So you can find me, I think I have a, I presented on Lindy uh, in the first episode. Uh, there's also a detailed breakdown analysis of it in my Substack. So you can find me at my Substack at aricjp.substack. Thank you. John? Uh, a bit of a social media hermit now. Uh, uh, so just find me on LinkedIn. I guess, uh, yeah. Um, I admire the guys who continue to pump out content uh, like you guys, but like, yeah, so I'd rather be in a hermit doing research right now. <laughs> so find me on LinkedIn. Very good. It <laughs> yeah. means that you have made it. <laughs> How I wish. Dream. How I dream. wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, you buy, you buy the 40 number for me today. I think the last draw was 15 million. Okay, Stanley. <laughs> wow, okay, okay. Uh, Bunti? Yeah, um, YouTube, on YouTube, I'm just listed as my name, uh, Bunti. So you can uh, search. And then I'm also on Twitter or X. Um, I think these are the main two main platforms. Uh. Great. And also, I want to give a shout out to my, you know, uh, pet holder pod with my three other friends. Yes. Yeah, definitely check that out. Thank you. Yep. And uh, of course, myself is Stanley and you can find out more at learnwithstanley.com. Thank you so much for joining us. And please remember that everything that we talk about here is truly just for your entertainment and information purposes. Uh, it doesn't represent of the view of our employer or any company that we associate with and so remember to do your own research before making any investment decision and that's it from all of us I, my name is Stanley and till we meet again invest safely guys see you thanks guys thank you thank you bye, bye.